Hi guys and welcome back to another scale model shed video and this time I'm going to be building something fairly close to home as the model shop down here in Somerset is only a few miles away from RNAS Yeovilton. So I'm going to be building the Kinetic Sea Harrier FRS1 and I'm going to finish the model as one of the Sea Harriers that was deployed in medium sea grey with toned down insignia. And as the aircraft would have been pretty freshly repainted I'm going to go easy on the weathering. And I'm not sure this is the easiest kit to make look really good and it may require a little bit of work. So I hope you enjoy the video, here we go. So starting off with the cockpit and a nice pair of sprue cutters keeps clean up to a minimum. First I prime all the cockpit parts in black before using masking fluid to mask up the gauges. The masking fluid is then removed leaving the dials in black. This is a fairly easy method and avoids having to subsequently paint the dials on. I sharpen up a cocktail stick and cut a slice down it so it holds more paint. I then use this to apply detail to the dials in white. I find the cocktail stick easier for doing tiny marks because it doesn't have the flexibility and the possibility for error that a paintbrush has. And once that's done detail is picked out using a black panel line wash. The padding on the cockpit seat lacks any kind of texture detail. So I take some of VMS's modelling paper and paper shaper and create some textured padding. The seat frame is first primed in black and then after some detail is applied it's dry brushed using a silver. The included photo etch seat belts are then applied using VMS's CA glue. The front turbine vanes are first sprayed with AK Extreme Metal Steel before having a black panel line wash applied heavily over the top of them. This should give enough shadow down in the corner of each segment to make the vanes appear that they're separate sections and not one solid piece. I've got a few reference photos of this Pegasus engine where the vanes have been numbered, possibly for balancing purposes. I spray the inside of the fuselage with the same dark ghost grey I used to paint the cockpit. I carefully remove any primer from the mating surfaces to be glued. Before gluing into position the front intakes and cockpit assembly. The two fuselage halves have some slight warp in them so these are strapped together with tape before gluing. Thank you. 
and it's a good idea to check at this point that the nose comb fits correctly. And now we get to probably the most difficult part of this kit and that's the fit of the top fuselage and wing section. The fit of this section is slightly warped giving it some rock and also has some rather nasty gaps. But before that there's a little bit of adjustment needed on the underside of the wing section. So onto this top section and I decided to close the gap as far forward as possible. And this leaves a large gap at the back which is the easiest one to fill as it's a straight line. I start by gluing it just at the front and in the best position possible. I then secure it in position with tape and leave it to dry overnight. You're then free to clamp and glue the rear with the front section firmly fixed in position. And now to fill that gap at the back and I start by taking some 1mm round styrene rod. I shave this down on one side and then the other to create a thin rectangular strip. And I stop when it's just the right thickness to hold itself firmly in the gap. This can then be pressed in and glued into position. There's an incorrect location pin on the front air intakes that needs to be removed. And I also needed to remove some plastic from the inner part of the intake to achieve a good fit. Once they're glued into position two things become pretty clear. Firstly the cowling should seamlessly meet the fuselage and secondly we've got some nasty looking gaps to fill. Much easier than trying to apply putty to these areas is to make some sprue goo. For this old sprue is cut up into some old extra thin cement. This melted sprue is much easier to apply accurately than putty. And it has the advantage that it's the actual kit plastic you're applying to the model. If the sprue goo needs some help to level out, some extra thin cement can always be applied. Once everywhere is properly dry, all the joints can be trimmed and sanded.
Around these delicate areas you can really see the benefit of using sprue goo over putty. And these fillets on the front of the air intakes don't even require any sanding. Any damaged panel lines are rescribed using a razor saw. And any rivet detail is reapplied using a rosy riveter. Areas that have had any work are given a coat of black primer. And this instantly shows up any imperfections. And this isn't necessarily a stage that you should only do if you think you're finished with the sanding. The black acts as a guide coat and will give you good indication while working if there's any imperfections still remaining. Because as you can see here, it shows up all your problems. When you're gluing a section where the join is a panel line, it's a good idea to apply extra thin glue and then leave it for a few seconds before introducing the part. This way you don't get any glue oozing into the join which can ruin a clean panel line. The apertures at the front and the back of the cannon pods are opened up using a drill and then cleaned up using extra thin cement. I decided to mask the inside of the canopy using masking fluid. This avoids any dusty overspray which is difficult to clean out. And the trick here is to keep the masking fluid nice and thick so it peels out in one piece. The front part of the canopy is then glued on using VMS transfer fix. Transfer fix can be cleaned up using VMS weathering carrier light type. This doesn't damage the clear plastic and leaves no residue. I got all the way to this point before realising I forgot to put the lens in the front nose section. I managed to trim the shoulder off from around the lens and position it in through the gap using a piece of blue tack. And I don't usually use extra thin glue to position clear parts but for this I had little choice. I then prime the model in a very pale grey, consisting of Mr. Surface of white with the tiniest drop of black. At this point I didn't have much of a plan for the paint, but I did want to keep it fairly clean as this aircraft would have been pretty recently repainted. Once primed I decided as per this photo to create some darker areas around panel lines and hatches. So my first step was to use extra dark sea grey and then apply medium sea grey over the top. So this application of extra dark sea grey looks pretty haphazard and quite frankly it probably is. So here I'm not trying to create a modelling effect and I'm not trying to create any pre-shading either. In fact most of this is going to be covered up. As I said at this point I wanted the aircraft to look pretty freshly repainted and I figured I'd leave any weathering open to future discretion after the paint. 
This dark grey was mainly applied to give me the option for darker panel lines and to possibly slightly change the tone of grey for different sections of the aircraft. And if nothing else it will give me a guide, where painting pale grey over the top of a pale grey primer I'll be able to actually see what I'm doing. And now I use masking fluid to create the patches of darker grey. So then I go ahead and spray the medium sea grey over the top. After that the masking fluid's removed. These areas are way too dark so I tone down their impact with the medium sea grey. I then decide to just darken down the top wing surfaces and the centre of the fuselage by mottling a very thin down extra dark sea grey. I mask off the back panel line to create that distinction and I leave the control surfaces in the paler grey. So with the paintwork finished I give the whole model a coat of gloss varnish.
Once the decals are applied, I take a fine grade sanding sponge and remove any surface imperfections before the final varnish layer. The whole model is then given a coat of Mr Colour Semi Gloss Varnish. And now it's time for some weathering and I start off by applying a simple deep grey panel line wash. And once dry this panel line wash is wiped off using a soft cloth. And this cloth is very lightly moistened with enamel thinners so as not to wipe the wash out of the panel lines. Any wash left in difficult to get places can either be removed with a cotton bud or it can be used to your advantage. Oil paints are a great tool for changing the tone of certain panels. I use the oil unthinned and blend with a dry brush. Here I'm using white to lighten up one individual panel. I create some staining around the thrust nozzles again using oil paints. I decided to add a slight look of distress to the top surface of the fuselage and engine covers. This was achieved by blending deep grey panel line wash across the area before applying very small drops of odourless enamel thinners. Once dry this was then blended down with a dry brush until it achieved the effect I wanted. The Ford thrust nozzles are cooler than the rears and the paint will remain on them longer so these were first painted in medium sea grey. The rears were first primed in black and then sprayed with a very thin down dark earth which gave them a bronzy tint. I then applied black pigments over the top of a stone grey panel line wash. And here the panel line wash will act as a pigment fixer.
After painting the deflector shields with first steel followed by jet exhaust, they were given the same treatment as the rear thrust nozzles. I then started to create staining down the rear end of the fuselage and after seeing this picture thought it would be interesting to add panel line highlights amongst the staining. I'm spraying NATO black as a base for the exhaust staining. Once the NATO black and the burnt umber oil is down, I use white oil to re-simulate the grey underneath, picking out the individual panels. I use neutral grey oil to tone down any stark white decals. The landing gear is painted in light blue before being given a black panel line wash. I use Micro Industries Crystal Clear for the light lenses on the front landing gear. Having seen this in a few photos, I made one drop tank medium sea grey and one drop tank extra dark sea grey. I applied some zinc chromate chipping around the front end of the extra dark sea grey drop tank. Mixed stone grey for black panel line wash gives a nice effect when speckled over pale grey.
and luckily the masking fluid came out from the inside of the screen in one piece. So that's pretty much it for this one guys and I have to say I did find this model a little bit of a challenge. Visually I wanted it to look as realistic as possible but striking that balance between not over weathering but still having the model look interesting was tricky. But I hope you gained some tips and techniques that you can use on your own models. But still it's done and I'm looking forward to starting a new kit. And in that next video I'm building a small 170 second aircraft. So if you haven't already it'd be great if you subscribe to the channel. To purchase from me online you can check out scalemodelshed.co.uk and if you're down in the West Country you're more than welcome to come in and visit the shop. So that's it for this Kinetic Sea Harrier, happy modelling everyone and see you next time.